All right. My name is James Shepard. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. I am very excited about this event. Um, this event came about as a result of um, a discussion that I had with one of our group members. And the discussion was that a lot of times when you're selling merchant services, when you're selling payment processing, um, it can be a bit of a lonely profession. And you can a lot of times feel like um, you are a lone wolf and you're the only one that's doing what you're doing. And uh, it turns out that there's actually hundreds of other people doing what you're doing. And a lot of times, especially when you're new, you just don't really know where to turn to get advice or help. And so what I wanted to do was I wanted to create a panel and I wanted to create a panel discussion where we would get the um, experienced people uh, to come on and explain to everybody else um, what they do. So um, what I'm going to do in just a second here, and let's go ahead and get our panelists to just go ahead and turn your uh, cameras on and your uh, microphones on. All right, so we're going to just dive in because I have a lot of stuff that I know we're going to want to talk about, and I really wanted to leave a lot of time for Q&A at the end of this. Um, and so I think we're going to do, Adam, we're just going to kind of start out with you. And so we're going to, I have two questions for each of our panelists. We're just going to go through and ask each of them these two questions. Um, and the first question is, how do you prospect? So Adam, walk us through, you know, who are you out there prospecting? You know, how are you prospecting? How are you getting new contacts? What's your prospecting methodology? And maybe even what has it been and how's it kind of evolved? If you could share that with us. For sure. So um, I started out in the industry uh, 2014. I sold for Heartland for a little bit over five years. And, you know, I did the knocking doors, BNI, chambers of commerce, cold calling, stuff like that. And um, about the last three and a half years, I've been primarily focused on social media. Um, I leverage organic social media very well to generate leads, and it's um, that, in my experience, has been the highest return on investment with my time, <clears throat> because that's really all we're doing when we prospect, right? We want people to know who we are, do business with us, and process their payments, right? And um, when you, there's multiple ways to do it, and I can expand on it more later if you want. Um, I don't want to go too far into details, but social media is powerful it's free um it's easy to leverage and there's a science to it so let's give us some high level maybe for our listeners you can give a an example right so like what's a real common way because I, I think we're social media which i as you know i love that but you know i think a lot of our listeners yeah. struggle with like i get up at 9 a.m and do what like, <laughs> right. you know what so, i'm saying like, talk about that there's two ways to do it, two main ways, right? The first one is to be active in Facebook groups that have a bunch of business owners or really any of your prospects. Because if you think about it, that's a target rich environment and a lot of people turn to social media so they can figure out a problem to a, a solution to a problem. So there's plenty of business groups out there where people ask about payment processing and it's so simple that you could join the group, go in there and search and look like literally search payment processing or Stripe replacement or whatever go to those posts, some of them might be six months old or a year old, and you can comment with and say, hey, did you ever find a solution for this? Or maybe message them, right? That's a way like you see somebody that had a problem at one point in time, maybe it's current, maybe they just posted, that's a lead, right? That's an opportunity for you to go sell something, whatever it might be, or solve their problem. Um, that's one way, that's a, a quick way to get results. And the best and the most consistent way to create results is to post from your Facebook page, your personal page, every single day and for a long period of time and keep your content 80% regular, you know, regular social media and 20% business related, right? Cause if you're sitting on your page and posting about like, Oh, I do payment processing. I sell point of sale. I do this. People are going to get bored of that. Like that. Nobody goes on Facebook to look for a new credit card processor. They go on because they want to be entertained. They're sitting at Chipotle and they got to wait six minutes in line because there's people ahead of them. So what do they do? They pull out their phone and go to Facebook. The 80% of the content that you post about like regular life and your fit pictures of your family, you know, whatever, deep thoughts, all that stuff, people relate to that and they will get value from those posts. And they're going to think of you uh, when it's time for them to get a merchant account or when somebody asks them who they recommend or they open a business, whatever, because they've seen your name every day on social media or at least almost every day. And, and in that in that way, obviously with Facebook, I, I think I'm correct here in saying that unless you're friends with someone, they're not going to normally see these posts. So do you have some kind of a strategy where or like, are you trying to look for people to send friend requests to that would be more interested in this? Or like, is there any strategy to that at all? So that's one way to do it, but you actually don't have to be friends with somebody to, for them to see your posts. If your okay. posts have enough engagement, 
the algorithm will show posts to people that are local, that are interested in what you have to say, or they engaged on a previous post that was similar. Um, and if you if you're active in these business Facebook groups and you add value to the group, maybe you don't want to come off and be super salesy and say like, oh, I have something for sale. Like that usually doesn't work in general, right? Translate that to the real world. A lot of times when you prospect a merchant face to face, you need to like build a relationship and create rapport for, before that person actually agrees to give you some of their time. The same thing happens on online versus offline, right? So um, if you add value to a group, whether it's, um, I don't know, five tips on how to reduce chargebacks or, you know, ca is cash discount right for you? Like whatever, it could be anything. Or it could just be simply commenting with people and giving them value and knowledge for free. People will see you as a resource and they'll ask you questions. And nine times out of 10, if you get on the phone with them or help them solve a problem, it's going to result in a sale at some point in time. I love it. That's really interesting. It's, you know, the one, one thing, Adam, that I really, I was thinking about and I, I still never made a training about this. I wanted to, but one of the things I did when I was selling is I actually, because back then there wasn't that many Facebook groups, just to be honest right. with you, like, yeah. it was like seven years ago that I was like personally selling a lot full time. And what I did is I actually created the Facebook group. So I had like the first one for my community, you know, it's the Blair County Facebook you know, or Blair County business owners, whatever. And so I started the group. And then as a result of that, I spent like, I think at least for 60 days, I didn't even say anything about like what I do. I was just like moderating the group like I do with our, Facebook group now, kind of like you can't put promotions, you can't, you know what I mean, that kind of thing, and keeping it really a good group. Um, and then, you know, I started reaching out to people and just saying, hey, I know we're in the same Facebook group, we should connect in person, you know. And that's yeah. how I got my appointments, and I would I would go in. So, have, have you? Is there anything anything other? So you talked about Facebook. Um, is there anything else that you're doing uh, prospecting wise, whether it's social media or anything else along those lines that you're doing, or is it mostly the the two strategies you just mentioned? Those are like the main two that I do now. Um, and I'll say this, like when people see you on the screen and they see you frequently or consistently and you have the same message, right? Like I like to post inspiring stuff like because in the in early in the morning because who do I want to attract? Business owners, right? Business owners, we deal with a lot of crap and that sometimes we need to read something that's inspirational, right? Or something that they can relate to. So you build that value and that connection it takes time to have success with like the daily posting, but like I have not missed a day since January of 2019. Every single day I have made a post from my personal page, whether it was, you know, a long form post that people don't really read, you know, like let's be real, or it was a picture of a Clover system or a picture of my kid, whatever. The, the work compounds because the people resonate with you. I would bet you that every day now between, I would average, it's probably between two and three people that hit me up and they say, like today I got a message, hey man, I'm buying a business and I need a merchant account, here's my calendar link, can you help me? Like that's what the end product is, but it takes a long time and a lot of this discipline and consistency to actually make it happen. It's not the only way to generate leads, it's how I like to do it as a millennial, um, and it works, so. I love it, I love it, really, really, really good. So all right, let's 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 move over to Tam. Um, so, um, Let's start out by how do you prospect? So what's your methodology? What are the core ways that you're out prospecting today? Sure, James. So I started uh, my background real quick in bands and uh, for a couple of years, 2013 to 15, and eventually went on our own. And initially the first thing I did when I started, for those of you that are near, you know, I went through all my memory first, right? I just made a list of all the businesses that I know. Then I went through all my contacts on my phone and just made a list of everybody that either owned a business or knew individuals who owned businesses or a center of influence or a COI, we call it. And then we also, I also went through all my social media, Facebook friends. I just made a master list. That's how I first started. Just people that I already know or people that I know that know business owners. Uh, so, and I went through those. And then after that, uh, what we did was, uh, I also social media wise, I love to reach out directly on Instagram to businesses, uh, just message them and have a chat, start a and, chat, that, that's just, worked. Just to clarify that, you're saying you go on Instagram and what, you find like a company page and you message them or yeah. like how do you find the person to? Yeah, exactly. Okay. I'll, I'll find the, 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 their company page and just message them directly. Just quick introduction, have a chat and see, you know, sometimes that opens up. And, uh, you, you know, uh, does, again, it's not nine out of 10, they're gonna sit down with you, but it does work. Uh, yeah. if you do that enough uh, 
And then the, the, the main thing that I do is we currently uh, are using a sales genie, uh, just a CRM where you can pull up leads. Uh, the, I like it because a lot of times it has the owner name or, or the or the manager name, what have you, at least you walk away with a name. And what we do is uh, create a list. So I create a list uh, of, let's just say, 30 businesses in a certain area, right? And then we use this app called Circuit Router. There's many. Circuit Route Planner is what we use. It's circuit essentially route planner. Circuit, circuit Route Planner. So okay. if you have 30 locations to go to, obviously you don't go back and forth zigzag. So it'll give you kind of what's the best mannerism in approaching your route, uh, essentially. And uh, we do that. And then, uh, of course, then we you have to have a CRM to plug it in. So there's pipe drive. There's many great CRMs. I don't advertise for CRMs, but whatever you like to use. The key is just to have something to, once you have that interaction, put the data in right away uh, mm -hmm. and set up a time to follow up. So constantly while it's fresh in your head right there in the car boom 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 something an app on your phone where you can use so it's efficient and you don't forget um and then we have a drip campaign after that where we drip 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 till we close and then eventually if they say no leave us alone we filter it out we move on to the next one so uh we use a combination of these mannerisms to gain business see why they're great centers of influence uh, i love relations with cpas attorneys that work with businesses uh, we try to build as many relationships as possible, go to networking events, of course, but uh, so let's, are a few let's, things. let's zero in on two things you said, you know, obviously the Instagram uh, messages, I think that overlaps a little bit with like kind of what Adam was talking about. Yeah, but let's yeah. talk about when you're walking into a business, let's start with that one. Yes, so sir. when you first walk into a business, what do you say? What, how do you start these conversations? What, what tip would you give along those lines? So obviously, not obviously, when I walk in, I don't want to, start off by saying who do you use for your pos right um i'm sure they get 10 of those a day half on the phone half walk in so uh when i walk in i try to kind of take a take a second and just take in the environment look at the menu items kind of fill out the staff see what's going on just a minute and then uh, find something where it's a talking point for me something i like on the menu or the design of the restaurant anything just anything to connect with anyone and then um Depending on who's there, I'll, I'll, I'll say, hey, my name is Tam. And, you know, honestly, uh, if it's something simple where it's a coffee place or a restaurant, I'll, I'll order a drink first, you know, spend a couple bucks. No big deal, right? Just to, and then when you're up front, you can check out the POS, right, what they're using. So uh, I kind of do that, and then I kind of step back, and then I, I re-engage, and I say, look, uh, you know, I love your place. I noticed you have, uh, you know, shrimp burrito, one of my favorite. Uh, and uh, I, I just want to kind of, uh, you know, ask you, I noticed you're using the Clover, uh, which your point of sale, are you the decision maker, are you the manager? And then they'll tell me, you know, no, the manager is Juan or whatever. Um, and then I'll go talk to him and have a quick conversation and say, Juan, I know this is your lunchtime. I don't want to take a lot of your time. You're busy. But I don't know if you're using Clover. Um, I work with Clover, by the way, and I work with multiple POS systems. Uh, Long story short, uh, I know you're busy right now, but what's a good time I can come back and sit down and have a five minutes of your time, just have a conversation and, and you know and, and you know see what you're happy with, what you're not happy with, and, and whether we can help you or not. And um, if they're busy, that's what I do just to get a commitment to come back, and I, I'll just it's just get an appointment, boom, real quick. But if they have time, obviously right there, I'll try to engage right there and just go deeper. But I'm also aware of what's going on, so if they're busy yeah. and there are 50 things going on. I'm not going to try to push the sale. So you kind of feel a little bit aware of the environment. Yeah. You know, I think one of the one of the tips you just said that I, I love so much is, and maybe you could restate this or tell me if I'm wrong, but, it, but for me, when I'm going out in the field, like I went out uh, a couple of months ago to sell dual pricing. And when I was out there, you know, it really reminded me that like one of my primary goals in MRM prospecting is I don't want them to think that I came there to sell them something. Yes. I always have to have another excuse. Like that's what I, you know what I mean? So it's always like, Hey, that's I was exactly. actually going to visit somebody else. I have, I, you know, I don't think I've ever been in here before. How long have you been here? And yeah. so, you know, so whether it's, I'm there either as a customer, like you're talking about, like, Hey, I need to buy a drink, whatever. And then, you know, that, so it's like, I'm here as a customer and I happen to notice right. that, you know, that we could do business together exactly. or, or for me, it's, I just want to stop in to network. I want to stop in to say, hello, I'm not here to sell anything. I just, I was talking to my client down the road or I was just driving by, you know, that. So I think having that good excuse, you know, 
once you plant it in the decision maker or even the gatekeeper's mind that you're there as a customer or as a local person that's not like there to sell them, it's a lot easier. The walls are a little bit down, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit. Okay, so we're gonna keep it moving because I want again, I want to have time for Q and A, and I might have some follow up. So, um, Jimmy, let's go to you. So, Jimmy, tell us, um, let's tell us how long you've been in the business for one thing, and then tell us how do you prospect right now? What's your prospecting method that's working for you to get contacts? Great, thank you, guys. And I think both Adam and Mr. Tam, both of you guys have great ideas that that I've used as well. So, without touching on those, I've been in the industry now eight years, almost nine years. Um, I started in 2000, towards the end of 2012, beginning 2013, and um, I think for me, one of the things that I do now is I like to find common ground. A lot of times people within the first, second, third try, they get discouraged and they kind of want to walk away. But one of the things that I think stats have shown us is usually it's by the 12th meeting that these people have seen your face, heard your spill, that they're actually listening. So I have to remind myself that if I go with the expectations that I'm going to close that deal then, it's probably not going to happen. But I definitely want to A, find common ground. And I think some of the gentlemen mentioned that whether it's hearing a good message that morning, um, once they know what I do, I need to know what they do, what's their day. And if you're okay, I'll share a story. I would pass by a specific client every month. And it was, it was a big, a big um, client that I wanted to, that I wanted to close. And I would sit there, would talk to them. And this happened for like six months straight. I wasn't going out of my way. I would just park, go up. And it got to the point where I knew he was married. I knew how many kids he has. Hey, so how's your daughter? Hey, is she dating the same guy? It was those conversations. And the funny part is, six months into this, as I'm getting up to leave, I'm no longer even selling. This is how crazy it was. We, we began to have a relationship. He tells me, hey, Jimmy, we're ready to close with you guys. And instead of being excited, I said, well, why? That was my response. I was <laughs> caught on guard, right? Thank yeah. God he moved forward. But I think one of the things is we need to find common ground. And the way I prospect these clients is I want them to know that I'm going to be here. If I'm going to be here at the beginning, when you say no, imagine when you say yes. So I think finding common ground and something that's helped me, um, I think, is sticking to a certain industry. Because once you stay within a certain industry, um, whether if it's restaurants, whether it's B2P, whether it's car dealerships, whatever that may be, healthcare, dental, not saying you can't step out of that. But when you've actually um, understood that industry, when you meet individuals that work, for example, healthcare, you'll know the language to speak that's going to trigger something for them to actually say, Huh, this is more than a sales guy. He understands process in our pipeline. So really getting to know them. And I try to never go into an account without first making a phone call and finding out who the boss is. I don't have to tell them I'm doing credit card processing or merchant service. Hey, my name is so-and-so. I just and they don't even care what your name is most of the time. Who who is your manager? Was your manager in today? Yes, he is. What was his name again? Oh, just write those things down and make a list of those things as, as, as Tam had mentioned. So when I go in there, I can now say, hey, it's, it's Mr. James here. And they're assuming we've met, right? And kind of having that that common ground. Hopefully that kind of answers your question. Yeah, so let's dig into that. I like the phone thing. Well, a couple of things I love about that, um, but let's start with the phone. So um, nobody's talked about that yet. So you use the phone initially. So you're saying before you even go to a business, you had you find a, how do you find the list of people that you're gonna go to? Google Maps, so would, do you have a data provider? What do you do? When I first started, we have a lot of the resources that we have now with Instagram, with social media, you have that. But yeah. I'll, 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 I'll have a perfect example. A few weeks ago, I wanted to get a comptroller from a specific dealership. So all I did is I Googled. I Googled who the comptroller was, and I found two different names. And I knew, okay. So what I did is I found both those individuals in LinkedIn. One of them used to work for the dealership I was looking for, and the other one was now currently there. So I immediately knew, huh, I got two emails. One email is going to bounce back because that domain She's moved on, but now I want to find out, let's hit both of these up. So I was able to actually reach out. I walked into the dealership and there was a receptionist. And first thing I always ask is ask people's name. That is so important. As soon as I walk in, hey, how you doing? My name is Jimmy. What's your name? Um, Katie. Hey, Katie. Thank you so much. Hey, is so-and-so here? Um, I want to speak to her. Oh, she's actually not here today. Well, I tell you what, just let her know I came by. I'll come by next week. I leave my card. But now when I send that email or when I make that phone call, Hey, Comptroller, I spoke to Katie last week, by the way. Give them props. She was really sweet. Now it's like, wait, Jimmy knows Katie and, and so forth. So without getting too deeper, that's kind of how, how I like to do things. I really, really like that. That's actually that's actually really good. One of the things I would say that I don't know if you found this, Jimmy, I wonder if it's kind of partly maybe the vertical you're going after, but and maybe Adam and Tam, I don't know if you've seen this, but to me, it seems like the amount of follow-up and the number of visits has a lot to do with the size of the business, at least for me. 
right? Like, I don't know, for me, it seems like when I'm going after the really big fish, um, I seem like you, I remember uh, one of my biggest sales I ever made was this huge um, ski resort and like golf course, you know, it was like the, basically they own this like mountain here in Pennsylvania and they have like all this stuff, you know, that they do. And six months, you know, like you, like every month, I literally would drive up there. It's like 30 yeah. minutes to get, you know, I would drive up there and I knew everybody there and I'm like, Hey, how's everything going? Just checking in. Cause I knew they were under contract and I couldn't get them out of it. It was liquidated damages, but just talking to them, talking to them, talking to them. And eventually, you know, so my, my philosophy going into the like, like smaller towns would be eventually I'm going to sell everybody. And, and Jimmy, one thing you said that I thought was interesting is it sounds like, you know, you, you got to understand some people are going to be having a bad day. Like, right. Like, I don't know. Do you experience where like, you don't want to take it personally when you go in and it's like, you can still follow up. Even if they said like, I'm not interested. Well, that doesn't mean a month from now, maybe they're, maybe they aren't ticked off at their employer. Or didn't just have to fire somebody. They might be in a better mood. Is, do you find that like you keep going back to people even after they don't buy? Yeah. And I'll say something that maybe you guys may or may disagree with. So what happened was, was this specific individual, she ends up telling me, Hey, no, we, we integrate with our system. You guys can integrate. It's kind of like sole proprietor. I get it. But the fact that she picked up the phone and called me, I found that as a value. So what I did is we ended up sending cookies to the team on a Friday and say, hope you guys have a great end of your weekend. And there was a special gourmet cookies. And then I told her, hey, I'll be checking out with you every month in case you have any questions. Because remember, when a client says no to you, it doesn't matter. The next thing you're doing is just keep that relationship because if they say no and you walk away, you were just there for business. And yeah, we got bills to pay. But I believe that the people who have said no to me within a year, they eventually say yes, because I, I generally want to build relationships with these individuals. So maybe it was the end of the month for some of these people. And, you know, it's the end of the month. Let me send something. Just just say, don't sell them nothing. Just say, I hope the end of the month or the beginning of the month ends up pretty good. Here are some, some cookies. I hope you have whatever it may be. You know, I hope yeah. you and your team, because I don't want to send it directly and come off kind of weird like, for the team. Yeah, here you go. It's for everybody else. So, yeah. um. Yeah, that's one of the things I would, in consistency, I, I think Adam mentioned that. Consistency is key with just about any aspect of our lives. Yeah, I love it. Okay, so we're going to move on quickly here to, I gotta, am I pronouncing this right? Is it Duran? Am I saying that right? You got it. Yeah, okay. you got it. Awesome. So so Duran, um, tell us first, how do you prospect? How do you go out and find new contacts? I'm sure there'll be some overlap with what's already been said, but give us some context of how you find um, new contacts. Definitely. So I think, actually, I think I do things a little bit differently than everybody, but I oh, love, yeah, I'm a little bit more old school, actually. So, and, and I'm going to go from the beginning, right? So when I first started out, what I would do, I would do drive-bys, actually. I would go to like industrial areas. And I, what I would do is I would write down the business names, whatever I can get, and I would Yelp them, right? And then from there, um, you can, you can get a lot of information. You can get the owner's name or, you know, whatever the case may be. And then I would call them. And I'm, I'm not as much of a walk into the business. I'm more of a phone guy. Um, and and okay. the reason the reason I say that is because you, know, you could hit three or four or five businesses in a couple hours, or you could hit you know, 20, 30, 40 calls in a couple hours. So that, that's why I looked at it as a number game, numbers okay. game. And you know, as long as you're putting in the work in uh, and you're really working, uh, you're, gonna, you're gonna get results. So, so that was my kind of start. And then, then what I started to do was, Really, word of mouth. I think I think my favorite thing now is kind of getting referrals from my deals. So what I oh, do I is that. I call my deals and I get referrals. And and you know I was actually speaking with Tam earlier today. I think those are the warmest. The and Tam and I work together actually at Wells Fargo. Um, sure. Those are the warmest deals you can get because if you're going to get a referral from somebody that's already processing with you, in my opinion, that's a really hot deal. So when you get to the level where you have 20, 30, 40 deals and you can get deals from your deals, I think that's the easiest way to go about, you know, growing your business. So I've got two follow-up okay. questions. And, and by the way, I, in full disclosure, I actually did not plan the panel quite as well as it might seem here, um, but it's amazing that like literally each of you do something significantly different. So I think that's fantastic because we're gonna be able to answer a lot of questions. And if you have a question already, go ahead and start typing those out in the question box. We're gonna get to those in a minute. I'm gonna try to moderate and, and throw them to the right person here. So um, Duran, when you think about, um, the initial call, you know, you, you did the drive by, you've got the name of the business, you look it up and figure out, you know, then what do you say when you, when you first talk to them, what are your tips of just, how do you get that initial contact? So I think it's always situational, uh, and it depends on the business. Uh, but I was targeting wholesalers. So what I would say is to payments, 
Right. So exactly. Because, you know, the way I looked at it is, you know, you, you're going to put in the same amount of work. Why not work on the ones that will make you more money? That was money. my, my, right. So that was my thought process in the beginning. So what I would do is I, I would call them and say, hey, uh, you know, I, I do business. Let's say it was a cabinet company, right? I'll right. say, hey, I, I do business with this cabinet company. So I just like Jimmy was saying, you hit it on the nose. Um, I, I do. You, you build rapport and you, you find common ground, right? So I do business with this cabinet company and, uh, you know, I'd love to, you know, I'd love to show you what I do and they're happy and they're saving a lot of money. So I'd love to, you know, love to introduce myself and show you what I do. So that, that's how that would go. I would try to find some common ground, just like Jimmy said, this is, that's, I, I think that's the best takeaway um, that you could ever, you know, anything, if you take away anything here, I think it's the common ground thing. Yeah. So, I, and I like that. And, and I think one thing that's interesting too, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Duran, but in my experience, when you're going after B2B, the approach can be a little bit more direct, meaning, you know, there's not quite as much competition there of like, they've talked to seven other payment people today. And so you can actually say something more direct, like, um, I, I offer payment processing services, but we optimize for B2B or whatever. Have you felt like, do you, it sounds like you're talking about that pretty quickly in the conversation versus maybe somebody going direct to like restaurant retail, they might start off a little bit differently to kind of warm them up a little bit because they know when they bring up payment processing, it's like, well, you're the 10th person. Like Duran, what are your thoughts on that? I think that's that's 100% accurate because these guys aren't getting an approach every two seconds. These guys are hidden. These guys are in industrial places. People don't even walk in. And if they do, it's like UPS just to get a, you know, salespeople <laughs> don't walk in, which is, which is great because, yeah. and they do the most, right? So that, that's, that, that was my thought process coming into this industry. I was like, you know, let me spend time on something people don't do too often. And let me be that, you know, that odd fish, right? So I, I think you, you hit it on the nose as well. And that's, that's exactly what I did. One last question real quick, and then I want to get into the, to the Q&A. Um, so again, if you have questions uh, right now, type them out. I have a bunch of questions, so if I don't have a lot over here, I'll, I'll ask a bunch. But um, Duran, uh, talk to us about the referral since you're the one that brought that up. <clears throat> um, other than providing fantastic service and experience to your merchants, is there anything you're doing to proactively generate more referrals? Are you asking for them, and how are you doing that? Like, Give us a little context of how to get more referrals. So what I do is I call my current clients right you know we've all we've got our sub agents but you know i, I really want to you know aim at the the newbies you know the people who are yeah. just new to this industry so with that being said um I, I what i do is i call my client and i and i just say hey do you you know i don't i don't we all have our own relationships with our clients but do, do you have anyone that you know they're business owners so they do do you have anyone that you can refer me to and then, you know, if we get that referral, I ask for a couple, actually, I ask for at least three. Um, and if they do, that's the hottest lead because then you call this guy and you say, hey, X, Y, and Z sent me, you know, your information and boom, the, the you know, the walls are down, everything's open, the, the referral's already, it's already hot and ready to go. So it, it's not really about what you say, as long as you're taking care of them and you've built the trust, a lot of people don't understand our world. These guys are busy, you know, selling hamburgers or, you know, doing whatever they do day to day. So they don't know exactly how they're, they're, they're charged. I, what I've learned is 99% of these businesses, they don't know what they're paying. They know right. the, the overall gist, but they don't know how it gets there. Right. So as long as they trust you and, you know, you're, you're taking care of them, you could price them high and you could price them on, on the trust really. Um, so if they trust you, whether that, you know, actually my, my highest charged clients are the ones that like me the most, uh, yeah. surprisingly enough. So, you know, they, they, uh, they refer me the most too. Cool. Love it. Okay. Adam, we're going back to you with the first question. All right. So first question is talk about the timeline a little bit of, okay, you're, and this is coming from Steven. So you're on Facebook, you're posting like every single day, religiously, when did you start to get like, at least, you know, you got a lead or, you know, you started to see a little momentum. Was it like a year? Was it like a month? You know, what, give us some it ideas. Was, um, it was probably, I mean, I don't remember the first one, but I remember when I was like, dude, this is working. Like, holy yeah. crap. like probably a couple in a week or something. Um, let's say six months, because what happens is you're going to piss, pardon my French, a lot of people off that don't want to see your content, but that's okay because the Facebook algorithm will filter it away from them and it's going to show it to people that want to be inspired in the morning. They do care about uh, the, uh, the relationship aspect of, of something, someone, when someone's selling you and like they just know that you're the person for that. You're their trusted expert in their network for that service. 
Love it. And I, I, I think that that rings true to me as well. I mean, I remember when I first started doing what I'm doing um, 13 years ago when I started the YouTube channel, every day for three years, well, five days a week for three years, I did a video and a blog post. Now, mine was to merchant salespeople. And, you know, for, I would say about six months, it would get like, oh, every once in a while, somebody would like reach out and I'm like, oh my word, that's crazy. Somebody watched my video, you know? Um, and then it was like somewhere around that six month mark, it starts to, you know, go. So I love that. Um, Jimmy, you mentioned LinkedIn a little bit as kind of just a, a more like a data source. You know, you went there to find something out. I'm just curious, do you use, and this is coming from, I think, Stephen as well here, but um, are you using like the LinkedIn sales navigator? Do you do any other kind of link? Do you actually reach out on LinkedIn or do you just use it as a data source to then do a phone call, email, or visit? You're muted right now, Jimmy. Let's go. Sorry about that. I do it to find out their source. So I don't, I don't do anything additional on LinkedIn. I don't reach out there on LinkedIn. I have. Um, the results haven't been as much as positive as I wish wished it would have been, but I haven't been as consistent either. But I will say that what I try to do on LinkedIn is find out their current situation. So that way, when I walk into a location, I'm not walking in asking for Mr. James Shepard when James Shepard was there three years ago. And usually on LinkedIn, everybody's keeping up to date because either they, if you change your position, you're looking for a new job or whatever the case may be. So that's that's kind of what I've done on on LinkedIn or just social media, but LinkedIn primarily. Are, are any of the four of you using the LinkedIn Sales Navigator, like the extra paid thing where you get more data? Tam, I am. you're shaking your head. You're using yeah. it. How are you using it, Tam? Any, any, maybe you could just give like the 30 second spiel to our audience of like, what, how do you use that as a merchant sales professional? Uh, similar to Jimmy, just to uh, reach out to, to the owners and it, it gives you, when it comes to searching, it's easier to search and it gives you more access to searching when you, when you pay for it. So I have, I have access and I can be more specific in my searches to get the data that I want for specific businesses, what have you. Um, and if you're looking for, obviously, uh, this is off topic real quick, but if you're looking for agents, it also works well because you can type in search. Sure. And, yeah. Love uh, it. Um, profession, professions and it'll come up. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, no, I like that. Um, I, I mean, for, personally for our company and, and again, I, like our salespeople are selling ISOs on stuff, right? So it's very different, but um, Sales Navigator, like I just think it's the best thing ever. It's so cool. Um, you know, like one of the, one of the, my favorite things about it is that even somebody who you're not connected to, you can actually get a cell phone number on them. Like a lot of times. So I have right. our salespeople, they'll literally text somebody and, you know, and, and like, Hey, you know, I got your number from, you know, I got your number because I'm connected to so-and-so like whatever, you know, whatever we can say to, and it's like, man, right away, you get that response back instantly on the text message. So I think that's, that's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, if you're not doing that, just go to linkedin.com slash sales, I think it is. And you can learn about LinkedIn sales. Now, I think it's 80 bucks a month for an individual license. Um, oh, yeah. something like that. Um, okay. Uh, here's a question. Um, Duran, let me take this to you. So when you're cold calling, have you tried outsourcing it at all to have other people do this initial call? Have you done that? What is your, you know, how has that gone for you? What are your thoughts on that? So I'm, I'm really, I, I kind of self run. So I do it all myself, to be honest. I don't, I don't really have telemarketers or anything like that. So I really do it from A to Z. I, you know, I think the best sales, the one that you're fully in control of, uh, even with my sub agents, I try to take control and I try to do it myself, but, um, as far as, sorry, can you repeat the second question you're asking about outsourcing? Yeah, that was really it. I was just curious if you had tried outsourcing it and, and what the results would be. I wonder, have any of the other three of you done this? Have you done outside telemarketers and any thoughts on on that? I, I've thought about it. Um, personally, I think, um, like the gentleman mentioned, I like to really be on, on top of that. The, what I have done, and I, and I didn't mention is I have partnered up with other individuals like like the rest of the team here because I, I'm a strong believer that if you want to get things done fast, you could do it yourself, but if you really want to break records to build a team, I'm not talking about from an ISO perspective or anything. I'm just speaking like for me, I'd rather team up with someone like Tam or Adam or my other gentleman where I can say, hey, guys, this is the field you're good at. This is where I'm good at. If we came together, we could actually do something. So I could now, for example, let's just say Adam, let's just say I'm, I'm in the restaurant primarily, which I'm not, but let's just say I was. And Adam's like, hey, Jimmy, let's partner up. And now when he sends an email out, he could say, Jimmy's referrals, he uses my referral names, right? He could put those in. So when people can't reach out to my referrals, hey, they may not know Adam, but they know Jimmy. And together we could go and and I think together as a team, there's enough money to be made out there. It's a healthy competition. 
But I think that to me has been better than just outsourcing somebody who's going to get paid hourly and, yeah. and may not have the same passion. But, and I think we'll see so much more of that over the, over the coming years because as we get more into verticalization, right? And more and more people are like, hey, this is my niche. Like, this is what I'm, I sell this. I sell these three different softwares to these two different kinds of businesses. Like, that's my thing. Then I think we're going to start to see more of a collaborative environment because then all of a sudden we're not a threat to each other as much because we've got this kind of specific vertical focus. So I think that'll be really interesting. Um, let's see here. Let me find it. Oh, okay. Here's one. Good night. We didn't even talk about this. Um, pricing. So let me just really quickly start with Adam, but um, are you selling cash discounting, dual pricing, interchange plus? What Primarily, what are, what's your pitch? Yes, <laughs> all of the above. Um, <clears throat> I think that a well-balanced portfolio has a little bit of all of that, right? Most people are switching to cash discount or dual pricing now because that's just the, the pulse right now in small business owners. I think long term, we should still sell traditional accounts if a merchant doesn't want to pass the fee off. Or, or eliminate their costs um, because the long game is based on volume, right? Not margin. Because what happens, we don't know what could potentially happen with regulations and all these things that are probably have some of us a little nervous. But what wins is kind of what you talked about with your podcast, right? It took you six months before you had any traction, right? Just like posting on Facebook, consistency. So if you keep selling accounts, taking care of the ones you have, building your portfolio, yes, cash discount is usually awesome, dual pricing is usually awesome. Traditional mids are great too. I mean, it's relationships and maybe at some point they're eventually going to switch to uh, cash discount or dual pricing. So treat them as though they are already a cash discount slash dual pricing mid. Love it. Tam, what are you selling? Yeah, so uh, we're, we're kind of balanced between B2B and retail, to be honest. Uh, when the pandemic hit, uh, you know, uh, a, lot of, a lot of restaurants and bars closed down and uh, I kind of put it to B2B. B2B and, great optimization all that fun stuff and then as it started to come back i started to see this push towards restaurants on pos and, and I, I got back into the pos game as well so we have a pretty healthy balance actually between b2b and restaurants and uh, to be frank with you when it comes to cash discount and dual pricing it's hard enough to sell it because if you don't someone's going to come replace your account if there's a lot of pressure to sell it but it's it's, it's i'm being very frank um so yeah. You can, I mean, and again, I understand that people don't want to, but at the same time, it's kind of if that's what everybody's going to sell, they're going to come hit your merchant up, and if you had a chance to do it, they're going to replace your merchant, and there you go. So we we do we do a healthy dose of both, and uh, you know, and right. uh, like, like uh, just like Verona, so I, I love industrial too. So I, I'll go into those areas and uh, and, and hit them up with the optimization and. Even better technology where the terminal and the virtual terminal talk to each other and they love that stuff yeah. you know i wish i would have found that sooner you know if i could go back and tell my 13 year ago self something it would be like go after the bigger one the b2b uh, you know not not like exclusively like adam just said balancing the portfolio yeah. but it was like i feel like i didn't even discover that that was possible until i was like almost done with selling full-time well, the optimization stuff came out much later i feel like in the industry yeah, where it, you know, it, was, it was around but yeah it wasn't until yeah. maybe seven eight years ago that it even started to really take off so right um so. jimmy what about you what are you selling to and i think you have some verticalization there as well but what are you selling primarily um, i want to just touch something on you said i, I do agree yeah. with uh, the whole b2b when i first came into the industry there was a guy who was doing nothing but restaurants he was killing it but i noticed he he was pulling hair out of his head so i said how can i work smart so i really like and i'm sorry i forgot the gentleman's name that starts with a d but keep on sorry about that. You guys are all gentlemen, but I give my own gentlemen. Um, I do sell surcharge cash discount and traditional, but I lean more to traditional and surcharge, but I always present it to my customers. And the reason why I say the following, if another guy comes in here, he's gonna try to, I don't want them leaving thinking Jimmy didn't offer that. So I'm gonna say, hey, these are the three options we have. These are the three reasons why I think it's good. And I always tell them, and these are the three reasons why I think you shouldn't. I'm gonna give you the good, the bad, and the ugly. And the ugly may not be, possibility but anything's possible i think we all agree within the last few years once i present that i'm saying i'm here for you so that way if anyone comes in and tries to sell maybe just traditional they know oh jimmy has that too but i frankly between all of us here i really just stay with traditional and surcharge but i also do percent cash just kind of that's something they want to do love it love it uh duran i'm guessing you're doing mostly interchange plus if you're doing b2b right or am, am i wrong you know it's it's kind of crazy i actually I, I thought everyone on this panel would say cash discount but i guess not um <laughs> so he, here's my take on it uh you know I, I've, I've done cash discount and I, and I do do it don't get me wrong if i was a new rep 
it, it's all I would do. And the reason I say that is because you want to come out and you want to make some money quick and cash discounts, the best way to make some money. Um, I, yes, I do interchange plus 95% of my portfolio is interchange plus a little bit of, you know, whatever tiered, whatever you want to uh, sell, but uh, traditional, um, but cash discount is a really good way to make money. Uh, I don't know how long it's going to be around, but let's not get into that. It's, it's just, I, I've had some bad experiences. <laughs> let's not, yeah. I, I just, you know, I, cash discounts great. If I was starting today, that's all I would do. But I think long-term wise, like Adam said, uh, it's going to be the traditional and it's going to be the, uh, it's going to be the IC plus and all that stuff. You keep your clients there for longer. Um, I, look, I don't know. Cash discount hasn't been long, around long enough for me to say that, but that's just my opinion right now. Sure. Yeah. And it's like, my, my opinion is it's all going to be software. Right. So, you right. know what I mean? I don't know. The, the pricing is all, like, I, like all of you are saying to me, the dual pricing is like, that's the opportunity of the moment. And I think it's, it's very important. It's not irrelevant, but it's irrelevant compared to software. In other words, all these businesses are going to be using software that's designed for their business and payments are going to be integrated. So like, that's, that's the trend we all, you know, to me, I'm way more concerned about that than, than anything else. Um, but let's go back up to, wait, who's doing this? I think Tam, you were talking about how you uh, do drip, drip, drip. Yep. 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 Yeah. So what tool, what tool are you using and give us the 30 second version of like, what does that mean? What are you sending emails, texts? Are you, what do you, what do you mean by that? Um, so I send, I, I, I schedule my reminders. Uh, and then again, you can use uh, just the Outlook calendar or pipe drive or one of the CRMs, uh, what, what have you to remind you, uh, depending on the merchant. That's uh, so if I have visited them and uh, they're the type of merchant where I have to revisit them, I'll just drop by again in 40, so I'll send myself a reminder. But if I have called them or texted them, then I'll, I'll put a reminder to text them again. So drip campaign is essentially every three to four days you, you you touch base and you touch base until you get an appointment and close. So um, it just depends on the, the the original approach to ask your question and uh, what the approach would be based on that. The, the key is every three to four days. And, and I think to clarify though, you are personally doing that. You're not saying there's there's not not like this automated yeah. drip campaign where you're this email. No 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 no. no, no, no. Out, you it's... yourself. Okay. Yeah, yeah. you just. You're driving to your next appointment. You and you make sure you and just multitasking, yeah. right? That's what we do. So we only have one minute, and and we have a lot of other questions. So I just want to say two things really quick um, before I I thank our panelists here and we shut this down for today. Um, the first thing that I want to say is <clears throat> I would really encourage our audience to think about the you know executive assistant type person. Like everybody always goes for the telemarketer, but what I find is actually the thing that most of us are are best at as far as prospecting is prospecting. Like we're really good at that and, it, and other people are not. It's actually really hard to find somebody that's gonna be anywhere near as good as you as making that initial connection. What most of us are terrible at is organizing and planning the route. You know, we talked about routing the day. Well, if you're gonna do that drip campaign, who's gonna make sure that you're dripping them? Who's gonna make sure that they put that into your route? Who's gonna make sure that you're in the right area to do that drip visit or that call? Or who's gonna give you your list of calls for the day? Or, you know, so um, <clears throat> my biggest personal increase in productivity where I went from about 15 a month to 25 a month was when I got, you know, somebody to do my schedule and everything like that. Um, I think one other thing I wanna mention there is pipe drive, which Tam, you've mentioned a couple of times. Pipe drive is fantastic. Again, Tam said, I mean, we're not like paid sponsors of pipe drive, but yeah. They really are super slick for our industry because it's so focused on the sales process. It's not about customer relationship management. You get into like Salesforce or Zoho, you're like trying to fly a rocket ship when all you need is a tricycle. And with pipe drive, I mean, it's, you know, next action, next action, next action. Um, and so I think that's, I think that's really, really cool. Um, so last thing I want to say is we're going to stop it here because it's five o'clock, but I know there's a lot of other questions that I didn't get to. If you're one of those people, I apologize if I didn't get to your question, go to the community right now, the Facebook community and the group, post your question right there and say, hey, I attended the panel, loved it, but here's my, I didn't get this question answered. What do you think? And let's get the group involved in this discussion. I want to add a lot of value to the group. Um, and then again, remember next Friday, 415, we're going to talk about overcoming objections. Um, we're going to have some panelists back, you know, we're, we're trying to mix it up over the next four weeks. We have a, a variety of opinions, um, but definitely, you know, visit back with us again. So Adam, Tam, Jimmy, Duran, tons of value. I'm like super glad that we did this. I'm super glad you agreed to do it. I mean, again, these guys are not, this is, they're taking their time for free to do this and none of us are doing sponsorships or this is just, we're doing this for the agent community to help. 
And I really, really appreciate you guys' time. So thank you so much thank for uh, joining today.